Bonjour, bonjour à tous et bienvenue sur Mobility TV World. Welcome everyone for this premiere of Mobility TV World. It's a new adventure opening for us, opening for us at Mobility TV and uh, which marks the birth of Mobility TV World. 45 minutes of interview of CEOs all over the world, automotive and mobility brands all over the world. 45 minutes live on YouTube and LinkedIn's Mobility TV homepage and as well on Reuters TV and partnership with Mondial de l'Auto Paris, Live Cars and Equipe Auto. Today, and we are very honored that he accepted to be our first guest, CEO, a CEO who continues to prove to all others that you can make benefits and as well, keeping your mouth wide open to say what you think. He is dealing now with no less than 14 automotive brands, including Maserati, Chrysler or Peugeot. Stellantis has very recently shown its annual results, like many years before, beyond the most optimistic prediction, and has as well presented its new strategic plan called Dare Forward 2030. Not very far from Mr. Macron's strategic plan for 2030 either. The CEO of Stellantis is our first guest, and we are very honored to have you, Carlos Tavares. Good afternoon. Thank you for being live with us for 45 minutes. Thank you for being here. I say us because I'm presenting the gentleman journalist with me, co-presenting this uh, live, Jean-Éric Raoul from Lotto Journal and Sport Auto. Hello, Pierre. Hello, Mr. Tavares. Niklas Zaboy uh, from Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, hello. Good afternoon. And Gilles Guillaume from Thomson Reuters. Hello, hello, Mr. Tavares. Thank you. First, Carlos Tavares. And because this is the subject, of course, it's terrifying. It's our mainstream subject every day uh, since two weeks. War. War in Ukraine. What is at stake for you as an individual, as an observer? as a father, I guess, and what is at stake for Stellantis as well? Well, thank you for uh, asking me this question. Uh, first of all, let me just tell you that I'm delighted to be here with all of you for this first edition of Mobility World. Uh, on this uh, dramatic topic, uh, many things can be said. Uh, the first one I would like to say is that at Stellantis, uh, we condemn all sorts of violences and all sorts of aggressions. It is very uh, obvious for us that the number one priority is uh, to take care of the people. Uh, we have 71 employees in Ukraine. Uh, we have set a 24-7 task force to take care of these 71 employee, employees and their families. We keep close contact several times per day uh, we are supporting them, of course, paying their salaries, giving them additional allowances for them to be able to face the unpredicted expenses. We are also helping them for those who are asking for it to step out of Ukraine. Some of them are already in Poland. And of course, we are taking care of them once they cross the border. So number one priority is we take care of our employees. It is uh, also clear that uh, we have given a, a specific, specific donation to one Polish uh, NGO who is taking care of the refugees at the border. This is very concrete and we are in contact with that NGO uh, almost daily to make sure that they have uh, what they need and if we need to help more, then we will help them more. Uh, that's, that's quite clear. It is also clear that we have set another second task force that deals with the sanctions. The sanctions are decided by the political leaders and we are fully compliant on an everyday basis on those uh, sanctions because we have a specific team of lawyers who are looking at those sanctions and translating those sanctions in business decisions that we take every single day. So as in peacetime and wartime, uh, Stellantis is completely compliant uh, with all those rules, regulations and sanctions. We are putting our focus 
on specific uh, topics. And the number one priority is humanitarian, trying to limit the consequences and the, mad, the damage coming from this war. Uh, we also took another initiative uh, yesterday, which is to bring a specific assistance to all the products of our brands, which are supporting uh, humanitarian activities, uh, health activities in the country. So we have a specific uh, support and maintenance campaign uh, locally to help all those who are using our products for those humanitarian actions, and that would need assistance from our workshops. This is what we have been doing. We also decided yesterday that we would stop exporting cars to Russia and importing cars from Russia as an additional measure. Uh, this is very clear. Uh, I also would like to tell you that in our, in our mind and in my mind as a citizen, not as the CEO of Stellantis, it is now time to de-escalate. Uh, we see that we are in a fragmented world. We see that the more the world is fragmented, the higher the tensions. So we should conclude that creating more fragmentation in the world is not going to help us fix uh, the issues. And as the tensions are growing by the day, I think it is uh, absolutely clear that we are in a lose-lose scenario. It is time to reverse this. It is time to discuss and find a solution to protect, of course, the people, make sure that we stop this, this disaster. So I would like to call for find a way to discuss in better conditions. I would like to call for more humanitarian approach of things, and I would like to call for less fragmentation in the world, to have more global discussions, because humanity is facing many challenges, starting with the environmental one, and to fix global issues. We need global discussions. We do not need fragmentation. This is what I would like to answer to your first question. Thank you for asking. Gilles Guillaume. Decision to suspend export and imports to and from Russia. Does it mean that you are shifting production from the Kaluga plant to the west? Uh, what does it mean for the other uh, plants which produce the same cars, the same vans, uh, in Seville Nord in France and in Luton in the UK? And uh, your decision, does it mean you freezing also new business and new investment in Russia? The answer to your question is uh, absolutely yes. Uh, we are going to uh, make additional products, uh, additional volumes in our other plants. Actually, uh, the plant we have uh, in a partnership with Mitsubishi uh, in Russia is a very small one. Uh, we are producing 10 or, or 12,000 cars. We were indeed importing some of them to the eastern part of, uh, of uh, Europe because from a logistics standpoint, it made sense. Uh, those products will be easily manufactured in the other plants in Western Europe that are making the same products. So that's not an issue. Uh, but of course, as you know well, the overall production in Western Europe is constrained today by the semiconductor supply crisis. So that the limitation will come from the semiconductor supply crisis and not from this shift because those products could be easily made in our other plants. For this same kind of uh, uh, LCVs, we are producing the same products in France and in the UK. So that's not a problem of production, but it will bump on the semiconductor crisis. Uh, for the investments for the future, uh, it is quite clear that when you are in a war, uh, you are not thinking about investing uh, for the future. You are thinking about stopping the war and then figuring out what you do next. But the front, for, the, for the time being, of course, those investments are not on the table. Uh, we are taking care of our people, trying to respect the fact that uh, in our company, we have 170, 170 different nationalities, and we try to take care of all of our people. It's important that we all understand that we are a global company. We are a highly diverse company. We love all of our people. We try to take care of them, and we try to be and we succeed to be, at any point in time, fully compliant. Niklas Zaboui. Mr. Tavares, there are products, but also raw materials coming from Russia. Uh, for example, nickel. Can everything be replaced so easily if the conflict with Russia remains and sanctions uh, remain imposed? Well, that's a great question. You know, the first thing we, we should be uh, saying, I suppose, both of us, is that we don't want this war to last. 
the first thing that we should be saying is this war must stop. Because if we keep it going, there is a risk that it becomes bigger. Uh, and of course, there is uh, the risk that there will be some uh, supply shortages in some other products like the raw materials that you have mentioned. And the nickel is one of them, may not be the, the only one, but the nickel, as you know well, uh, will be needed for the batteries of the electric vehicles at one point in time. Uh, so that is going to be, uh, I think, one of the problems. Uh, so far, uh, surprisingly, uh, Stellantis has not been uh, hurt so much because our supplier base is not so much in the eastern part of Europe, uh, which is a big difference vis-à-vis -vis some of our competitors, and namely the German competitors. Uh, it is the situation. Uh, it may be just a coincidence, but our supplier base is not so much in the eastern part of Europe. So, so far, we have been less impacted uh, from that kind of shortage. But your point on nickel is, is, is valid. And, of course, uh, we may find out uh, in, the, in the next few days or weeks or months that other raw materials will be in short supply. So we are facing for the next uh, few years a situation where with a significant transformation of our industry, we are going to discover that some of those raw materials may be in short supply. Uh, it's, it's the consequence of the magnitude and the depth of the transformation that our industry is going through. As you know well, this transformation is driven by the regulations that we have to respect, and we do respect uh, rigorously. Uh, so we are in this transformation. We are doing as fast as we can. Our people are working day and night to get the job done with a, a level of commitment and focus that is totally moving. And I would like to thank all the Stellantis employees for what they are doing for the company and what they are doing for the planet. But your point is absolutely valid. There is a risk that at one point in time there will be raw material uh, shortage, and not only because of this war, but because of other sourcings around the world. Yeah, and being back to nickel, you're, uh, you agree with global data that says that Russian nickel sanctions would slow electric vehicle uh, agenda, and uh, by that way, decarbonation uh, in, in, uh, in the EU. It could indeed. Uh, you are, we are very aware of that because, uh, as you know, through the presentation of our strategic plan, uh, there forward 2030, by 2030 we expect to sell 100% of electric vehicles in Europe and 50% uh, in North America. So we are moving very, very strong and very, very fast in that direction, which means uh, no less than 400 gigawatt hour of battery supply, which is an enormous amount of batteries. And of course, uh, right now, some of the most important chemistries of those battery cells are based on uh, nickel, using nickel. So, of course, I suppose everybody is going to work on uh, replacing nickel by something else. But uh, that is also a factor that is going to use additional time. So, at the end of the day, as we have committed to be a carbon neutral, carbon neutral corporation by 2038, we are very much aware of the risk that uh, you, have, uh, you have commented, and rightly so. Jean-Éric Raoul. Mm, to, 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 to go on with the um, Ukraine, Ukrainian war, you, we have had recently uh, COVID, we have had a uh, chip shortage, we have now you, war in Ukraine. Um, for years, the um, automobile industry has been used to, to work on a fully open global world. Don't you think that all this crisis will, could change the way that the automobile industry uh, works now? Because with all this crisis, the global model seems to be um, questioned for the least. It's a great question. Uh, and I think that this great question deserves two kinds of answers. Uh, there is one, uh, one answer, which is what you what you understate in your question, which is, if the world is less global, uh, there will be bubbles. A bubble in Europe, a bubble in North America, perhaps a bubble in China, perhaps a few other bubbles. And everybody will try to operate inside of the bubble, 
uh, for local regulations with local products and local sourcing. Uh, it may be uh, something that works, and certainly uh, we will adapt to that situation if that was the case. Now, another answer, which is not an answer from the CEO of a car company, would be uh, an answer from the citizen. I think that the fragmentation of the world uh, will uh, bring less wealth and will bring more tensions. And we know that when there is less wealth and more tensions, the risk of war increases, uh, which uh, I would like to try to avoid as much as you do, I'm sure. So we need to keep in mind that the globalization that many people today uh, criticize, it looks that it is very trendy to criticize globalization, we should not forget that it brought millions and millions and millions of people out of poverty. We should not forget that it created a multilateral uh, global uh, coordination and multilateral global discussions that uh, created a good communication around the world. And right now, we are seeing that we are moving in the opposite direction, which is fragmentation, more bubbles, inward looking. It may work for a certain number of things, but it may also create a lot of tensions that would end up with a very nasty situation. So I would be a little bit more nuanced on the, on the understatement of your question by saying, yes, we can adapt to what you, you said, it's possible. We can work in bubbles, a North American bubble, a South American bubble, a, a European bubble, a Chinese bubble, that's possible. But then if we are all inward looking and only taking care of our own wealth, is that going to be a better world? That's a question that we should debate, but I'm sure we don't have the time today for, today for that. But yeah. that would be my suggestion for our next discussion, the two of us. Yeah, next discussion when you want, Carlos Tavares. <laughs> we, can make, uh, we can make it every week if you want. Um, in January, you, you raised your voice against European decision to restrain petrol cars in, in 2035. You were remarking that social costs are tremendously underestimated concerning that uh, matter, and also that the prices of cars will constantly grow. Today, you announce a plan of 75 new models, 100% electric. French and Germans are fighting against the idea of the whole battery philosophy. So I don't follow you quite enough to know if you want to make it whole battery or are you fighting against it? Because you have to look at it from two different angles. Uh, one angle is the competition in which my company is. My company is in competition with other car makers within a frame which is a regulatory frame. This frame is telling us that we must go electric. So we go electric, no doubt, because this is the, because it's the only way to be compliant with the regulations. Yes. The only way to be compliant with the regulations is to go electric, which we are doing and we are competing and as you know, we are racers at Stellantis. We love racing. We love to be competing, and therefore, we are bringing this very powerful Dare Forward 2030 plan to be competing with the other car makers of the world who are submitted to the same regulations. So within this framing of regulations, we will compete, and we will demonstrate to the world that we are among the best. Now, if you step out of this regulatory frame, and if you look at the planet, and you think about the environment and protecting the planet by fixing the global warming issue, what you need to do is to have a significant impact in the reduction of CO2 emissions. For you to have a significant impact in reducing the CO2 emissions, you need to improve a lot the emissions of the cars in operations and replace old cars by more recent cars, which are much better in CO2, but with a big volume impact so that it has a good positive impact on the planet. For you to have a significant volume, you need to protect affordability. And the big problem of EVs is that right now they are not affordable. So if they are not affordable, you cannot sell them to the middle classes, you cannot sell them at a huge volume. And if you cannot sell them at a huge volume, by the way, you don't have enough batteries, 
you are not going to fix the global warming issue. So then the question could be, instead of going only electric, shouldn't we mix electrified ICE powertrains to protect affordability and have a good impact on the planet while bringing up the EVs at a pace where we can reduce the cost for the middle classes to be able to buy them because they are affordable. So from a society standpoint, not from the racing car maker standpoint, from a society standpoint, the question that we should raise for ourselves is, are we protecting affordability to make sure that we have a volume impact that is going to have, help fix the global warming issue? That's why I'm saying that not only we have the social issue, which is something that may create problems at one point in time to the stability of our societies, but we have the real impact on fixing the global warming issue. And if we are not affordable, then the volumes will be small. And if the volumes are small, then the impact on the planet is not going to be so big. And we are told that uh, we are in a hurry. We are told that uh, we should go fast. So we are very willing to go fast, but uh, the people can only afford what they can afford at the end of the day. So I think that's going to be the big challenge of the next few years is how fast are we able to bring back affordability to the EV world? And how long can the states continue to subsidize the sales of pure EVs? I think that's a, a question for debate. Does it mean that you are pushing for a waiver on electrified vehicles, which means that beyond the end, the official end of thermal engine cars, would you still like to have electrified cars sold a bit longer? And uh, does it mean that the, the current shortage on nickel, for instance, and the push on EV prices uh, would uh, give you an argument on that? And on the battery factories, are you ready to announce uh, that the Gigafactory in Thermoli in Italy is ready to be launched? On the Gigafactories, uh, we are now uh, building the first one, uh, as you know, in Douvrain in France, preparing for the second one in Germany, and we will very soon shake hands uh, with the Italian government for the third one in Thermoli. I think we are not just looking for uh, uh, a convenient uh, date for everybody. So we are, we are on our way, and we all also announced uh, deals in North America to bring uh, the battery supply to North America, so that at the end of the day, we have five gigafactories to support 400 gigawatt hours of supply by 2030. So we are on our way. Uh, what is clear is that we need to find a way to protect affordability, because if we don't have affordability, we don't have volume impact. If we don't have volume impact, then we are not fixing the global warming issue. One thing that we could share with, the, with, with our viewers is, is very simple. If you look at the cars who are in, um, in operation right now in Europe, the cars who have more than 12 years old, on average, have more than 160 or 170 grams of CO2 emissions per kilometer. If you replace those cars, at an affordable price, uh, by a mild hybrid version of a modern car, you move roughly from 160, 170 down to 100. It's not zero, but it's a big gap. It's a big gap and it's affordable for the middle classes. So you may have a good impact by doing this, in addition to selling and ramping up on the EVs, which I believe with clean energy may be the best solution for the future. But it can only be the best solution for the future if you combine an EV car with clean energy. And then the question is, where is the clean energy? How fast are we going to go to 100% uh, of clean energies? And we know that in the current context, uh, we already have energy problems, energy shortage, and energy inflation. We know that not all the countries are producing clean energy, and we need to ramp up the mix of clean energy at the same time as the consumption per person is increasing also. So there is a big, big challenge to bring to our citizens clean energy at a higher mix at the moment where the total amount of consumption is increasing also. That's the reason why, for instance, uh, France decided to boost its nuclear program. 
I'm not sure that all the European countries, for instance, Germany, would agree with that, which means that we have an energy issue to fix, and now all the EVs are on sale. So all the EVs are on sale. We will have 75 EVs by 2030. So the question is, where is the clean energy and where is the charging network density that is going to remove the range anxiety from our consumers? So you see energy, infrastructure, EVs. At the end of the day, the first ones to be ready are the car makers with EVs. So now we need, we need the two other components. And I agree with you, Guillaume, I think we need to work on the transient period to make electrification accessible to the middle classes. Should it, should it be made longer, that transition period, because of the current crisis? If it makes sense to fix the global warming issue, why not? It's just a matter of not being dogmatic uh, about fossil fuel. But as you know, many uh, people in our societies, what they want first is to get rid of fossil fuels. If you want to get rid of fossil fuels first, then indeed you need to wait for the ramp up of pure electric vehicles, but then you also need to combine it with clean energy. So for Stellantis, both are fine. Either we go full speed to electric vehicles because we are ready for that, and that's what you, you saw in our plan uh, last week. Uh, but then the question is, where is the clean energy and where is the infrastructure, which is lagging behind? Or we try to have an impact while using the volumes that are connected with the middle class's affordability. And from there, we try to remove from uh, the road the clunkers who have a very bad performance on CO2 and we replace by more modern vehicles and that may have a better impact on the planet. So I'm looking at this problem from a, a pure environmental perspective, which is to have a good impact on the planet, uh, the most important is to remove clunkers from the road and replace by products which have a significant improvement against those clunkers and they have to be affordable. If not, middle classes will not be able to, to pay for them. So. Answering to your question, we are very open to that discussion, but frankly, we don't need it. We so, can go full speed to the electric vehicles. So if I may say so, you announced something for 2030, but you don't really believe in it. No, I would not say that. Uh, we are full speed on executing the plan, but I'm, I'm not carrying the responsibility of the regulations. That's it. So the regulations are made to fix the global warming issue. And if you want to fix it, you, you cannot only do it with the EVs, you need the energy and you need the infrastructure. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Niklas. Mm. We talk about, Mr. Tavares, if we talk about affordability, in the last days it was especially the gas and the petrol price, so the price for diesel and so uh, going up. Uh, do you think on the other side that could maybe push people for EVs because electricity has also been, become, uh, has also the price for electricity has also increased heavily, but maybe the petrol price more. So do you think that could be a chance for EV right now? Sure, I think it is. Uh, I think you are right. I think it is a chance because you can easily calculate the total cost of ownership benefit of an EV against the current price of gas. So uh, your, your point is valid. Uh, you could make a business case out of saying, well, uh, at the current cost of gas, uh, if you go electric, uh, in a few years, the savings that you are going to generate are going to compensate for the additional cost of an EV today. That makes sense. What we don't know, both you and me, is what is going to happen to the gas price. We don't know. Uh, maybe uh, going up or going down, depending on how the war is going to be fixed. If, if we find a solution for the war, most probably uh, the gas price will go down again. Uh, so we don't know if this high price is going to last. And the second thing that you don't know, and I don't know either, is Currently, you have in, uh, in Europe a tax revenue for the states of no less than 450 billion euros. 450 billion euros of tax revenue from gas, from petrol. So once you, the mix of electric becomes significant, where are those tax revenues going to land at the end of the day? 
Are they going to land on electricity or are they going to land somewhere else? Because as we know well, I don't think the states uh, in which we are living can afford to reduce tax, tax revenue uh, given the situation of the budgets that we are all facing. So there is two big things that we don't know. One is, how is the gas price going to evolve over the next few years? Because when a customer is going to make his calculation, he's going to calculate on a five or seven year time window. So he has to make an assumption on the gas price for the next five to seven years, and we don't know. And the second one is, what is going to happen to the 450 billion euros of tax revenues for the European states that we currently have? And we don't know if this amount or part of this amount is going to land on the back of electricity. We don't know that. Jean-Éric Raoul. Um, to, stay, to stay on electric cars, but maybe a little bit down to earth. Um, today, um, Tesla is the benchmark when we are discussing about electric cars. And this was logical when they started because they were almost alone. But, but today, uh, it seems that um, historical car makers struggle to to come to the level um, in terms of ratio of cost to range, which is relevant for customers. So um, what do you think about uh, this fact and how you will change that and, and come and, and pass uh, Tesla in terms of uh, price to, ra to, to, to range uh, ratio? First, uh, I think that uh, we are all announcing uh, a lot of good news in terms of uh, increasing uh, the range of our uh, BEVs. Uh, I already announced that our new BV focus platforms will go up to 800 kilometers of range for the highest products and uh, also uh, many products at uh, uh, six and 700 kilometers of range. So I think that all the car makers, at least the ones we are thinking about, you and me, are now planning to bring uh, very quickly uh, EVs in the range of 500 to uh, 700 or 800 kilometers, which is going to be enough for those products to be the only car of the family, as long as there is a visible charging network. So the key factor is as soon as we reach 500 or 600 kilometers of range, then you can have one single car in the family, which is an EV, as long as you can see that there is a reasonable density of the charging network, which means that uh, the European states need to invest on the charging network density, which is the same for the US, by the way, same problem. So that's uh, going to fix uh, the issue that you are highlighting. I'm very confident, I'm trying not to be arrogant, just confident on the fact that uh, we are going to catch up uh, in the next couple of years with Tesla. And it's going to be a very healthy competition, very good for the consumer, by the way, very healthy competition, because I don't think that we can say that the engineering divisions of the car makers are less skilled than uh, the engineering of Tesla. I think that ju they just started before with a very clear visionary decision to go electric only with no legacy, so much lighter, uh, much less inertia. And they took the advantage of that, which is fair, and congratulations to them. Now we are coming back, and we are coming back very strong. I think we have a reasonable understanding of the customer needs, and therefore uh, we will bring very competitive products. And I think this, this kind of catch-up uh, on the technology will be done within the next two or three years, uh, because we have an uh, enormous amount of engineering. In Stellantis alone, we have 30,000 engineers in more than 25 countries. So we are absorbing the best of the engineering talents of the world to bring the best solutions for our customers with the common engineering assets and technology assets of Stellantis. So I think that what you, what you state, which is true, is going to vanish in the next couple of years. But we'll see, you'll be the judge. We'll be the judge, but to continue on Jean-Eric's question about Tesla, are you planning, because all of these of that, that you say has costs, enormous costs. So it will take a lot of money. Are you planning like Tesla to go more on the soft? I mean, in the car, there's the hard and the soft. And uh, hard would be, I guess, a unique model for, for all brands. And then the soft will be the identity of the car. 
Is this the future of car and automotive? I think it's going to be both uh, of what you describe. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, we, we have a very strong plan in the Dare Forward 2030 about software. We are going to bring uh, additional 20 billion euros of revenue by 2030 on the software-driven uh, features. Uh, we are going to set up a team of 4,500 engineers, software engineers, to achieve that. And we are going to train 1,000, uh, I would say, conventional engineers to become software engineers on a yearly basis with a specific software academy that we are now building. So we are very uh, uh, bullish on, on software, and we understand that software is going to bring a lot of additional services, additional amenities, and will be part of the convenience and the joy of using this uh, mobility device that we call a car. Now, I don't think that this is going to uh, cancel the emotional value of a specific brand, the emotional value of a specific design, a specific styling, a specific kind of materials, a specific kind of sound, or a specific kind of smell. I don't think so. I think it's going to be additive. I think that on top of having the brand you love, the design you love, the materials you love, the fit and finish you love, the performance you love, you will have the features you love coming out of software. So I think you need both. And I don't think one is going to uh, exclude the other one. I think they are just going to add to each other. Yeah, but uh, which is going to make our, our business even more exciting in the future. Hard costs more, and uh, if you, uh, if you uh, invest in soft, it's, uh, it's less expensive. And as you said a couple of months ago, uh, prices of cars are raising, so maybe it would be a solution. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is a, a great topic you are, you are raising. Uh, we were the other day discussing, when you look at the life cycle manager, management of a product, Usually speaking, uh, when you reach uh, three years of age on the life cycle, you change the bumpers and you change the headlamps. Well, perhaps tomorrow, uh, if you have a successful, su successful styling, you will not change the bumpers and the headlamps. You will put more uh, services and more features in your infotainment system with the over-the-air software. That's something that we are now planning to do. Uh, it is a clear direction, again, I don't think it's going to reduce the emotional value of having a nice car with the right performance, the right materials, and the right fit and finish at the end of the day. I think it's going to be additive, and it will give more room for differentiation between the different car makers. And the only, the only person that is going to benefit from that is the consumer. So the consumer will be happier with this. But as you said, and you are absolutely right, I agree with you, we need to make sure that we protect affordability. That is going to be key. The use of software in the cars will allow a lot of data to be uh, processed. Uh, in your view, who should own the data? Uh, who should get access to the data? Uh, just OEMs, co-developers, or insurers, fleet managers? What is your position uh, on that, R thinking that uh, European regulation is going to touch the subject in the, in the coming future? Sure. You need data, Guillaume. First of all, you have to collect the data, right? Uh, so it has a cost. First, you need to collect the data. Then, if you want to create value, you need to crunch the data, as we say, uh, which means combine data uh, to uh, generate a certain level of aggregation that represents a benefit for those who want to buy the aggr aggregated data. Uh, so it's, it's quite clear. Um, let me give you an example for our viewers to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, we have uh, been uh, selling to a certain number of cities information about the uh, crossroads where the anti-lock system of the cars are being, uh, are being active, which means statistically we can measure what is the frequency at which an anti-lock system is activated on a given crossroad in a given city. So we can crunch this data and then give it back to the mayor saying, well, in your city, the top 10 most dangerous crossroads that you should modify are these ones. Because we have collected the anti-lock breaking uh, data and we see that on those 
crossroads, generally speaking, people activate the anti-lock because the visibility is not so good or uh, the, the surface is not so smooth or whatever it is. So we are aggregating the data and then giving a, a valuable information to the mayor, which is the list of the most dangerous crossroads that he should be modifying. This is a way to create value. So you see, it's not just about collecting, it's also about crunching the data in a way that is going to create value for somebody to be willing to pay for, for it. Now, I know that there is a lot of discussions about the regulations on data, etc. You know, at the end of the day, it's very simple. Uh, whatever the regulation will be, we will comply. But if by complying to the regulation, we have no business case to collect and to uh, crunch the data, then we will not create that value. It's very simple. So the question is, do we want to create that value? Like the example I have just given you, or we do not want to create that value. If we want to create that value, then we need to make sure that the guys who are collecting the data and the guys who are crunching the data are willing to put resources on that topic for that topic to fly in terms of business case. And if that doesn't fly, fly on in terms of business case, then possibly that work will not be done. And the society will not benefit from uh, the great brains of our engineering divisions on that topic. That's my answer to your question. Bill. Okay, we have five minutes left. So quick uh, question, quick answer, please. Yes, to follow there, uh, if it comes to data and software, for example, if I may contrast, uh, Volkswagen develops a system on its own, whereas you have a cooperation with Amazon. Don't you fear that you lose your independence uh, on a core product, on the core thing of Stellantis? Uh, my answer, no, I don't think so, because the partnership with Amazon is about what we call the middleware and the operating system. It's not about the upper part, which is in contact with the final customer, which we control completely through a specific company called Mobile Drive, where we work with Foxconn uh, to create all the softwares and all the features that are in direct contact with the final customer. Uh, the partnership with, Fox, with Amazon is about the middleware and all the operating systems that, of course, we don't want to invest in because it's a, an expert matter that is not where we want to put our resources. So the resources are put on everything that is interfacing the customer needs and brings an answer to the customer needs. So your, your question is very valid. On this specific case, I don't think that we are facing that risk. Jean-Eric. One last question with cause and passion. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, just in, in your portfolio, you have a lovely brand which is named Alfa Romeo and which is a kind of mystery for me because everyone loves Alfa Romeo but no one buys Alfa Romeo. So how you explain this kind of mystery and what, what will you make to change this? It's indeed a mystery, uh, specifically for people like us uh, who love cars. Uh, it's a mystery. Uh, I can tell you what I'm trying to do. Uh, future will say if it makes sense uh, to achieve the results that we both expect. First, what we are trying to do is to make sure that we are completely merciless in uh, fixing uh, any quality issue. Number one is fix quality. Make sure that quality is stellar. And uh, we have been extremely demanding, if not as I said, merciless against any quality issue. Uh, we have been uh, extremely focused on the, preparing the launch of the new Tonale that is going to be launched very soon and giving clear instructions to the team as long as you don't meet rigorously all the quality standards of the company, the car doesn't go. The car stays in the plant until we make sure that all the quality standards are rigorously uh, respected. And the, the timing will be the consequence. So there is no, uh, no uh, absolute constraint on the timing. The timing is the consequence of reaching the quality standards. That's point number one. But the point number two is that you need to think about uh, Alfa Romeo uh, in a large time window. It cannot be just tactic. It has to be strategic. Because one of the questions that we could raise uh, to, to us, uh, to you and me, is what is the change 
in the customer segmentation and who are the customers that Alfa Romeo should be targeting? Is the fact that we are a very sporty brand enough or should we look at where is the segmentation, the target customer segmentation that we would like to target with Alfa Romeo? And things have changed since, uh, since uh, the 70s or the 80s. And the customer segmentation has changed a lot. Uh, we need to look at that. And I, I think we have understood a few things in terms of targeting of the right customers that could be interested by an offer of mail. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that we make sure, we need to make sure that we make money. There is no salesperson in our company who is interested in selling cars with negative margins. Why? Because all the business guys in the car companies are incentivized on the profit that they generate. So they will not sell cars which are not on a per unit basis contributing to improve the profit amount that they need to bring to the company. So it's very important that uh, uh, Alfa Romeo is profitable. And the great news is that uh, in 2021, we brought it from uh, the red to the black and we are improving the profitability of Alfa Romeo every day, which gives a lot of confidence to our team to create the models that we will have in the next 10 years, because as you know, I'm giving a 10 year funding commitment to my brand CEOs for them to plan their uh, portfolio renewable on a 10 years time window. So you need to give them a long term perspective. You need to target the right customers. You need to make sure that the quality is stellar and you need to make sure that you make money. So those are four uh, simple things that we need to do. Uh, perhaps there are more, perhaps we didn't understand everything, but I think we have understood a few. And I can tell you that Tonali is a great car. And the next one to come is going to be extremely gorgeous. And you'll see that Off Romeo will be absolutely thrilling on the, the talk of the EV uh, versions that we are going to sell very soon. If there are more topics, we really need another session with you, Carlos Tavares, because we have plenty of questions left for you. Thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Carlos Tavares. Thank you Thank for you. being with us live. And you can, of course, see that program replay very shortly on our homepage and Reuters TV. Thanks to our sponsors and see you at, uh, with the Mobility TV teams at the Automotive Mondial of Paris starting October 17. Thank you and goodbye to all. <laughs>